it doesn't mean that we have it just because it's written in the Bible. So there's a gap between our experience and what is written or what is promised or what is expected or what is, um, what is available. There's a gap. And we are supposed to know this. We're supposed to see this. We're supposed to look into this. And that's supposed to create in us um, a desire, an appetite, a hunger, um, Maybe even, maybe even a frustration. Like, wait a minute, it's not supposed to be like this. Yeah, but it is. We can even see, remember Gideon? <laughs> yeah, Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. So that means he was down in a lower place to hide himself from the foreign invaders, the Midianites, because they were in a oppressive situation. They were in a weak position. They were overrun by a foreign army, and they didn't have control of their own country. And so the Lord appears to him and says, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And he's like, what? If the Lord is with us, then where are the things that he was doing for all of our forefathers? Where are all the miracles from our forefathers? And the angel said to him, go in this strength of yours. Wait a minute, what strength? That's the question, what strength? I think it can be um, interpreted in different ways. I've generally interpreted it to mean God is with him, so that's his strength. But I think there's another angle you can look at it from, and it's this. Notice how he recognized the current situation. He was not pretending everything was perfect or great. He recognized it wasn't. He recognized they were oppressed. He recognized they were not having the miracles that they'd had in the past. He recognized that it's like, where is the God of our fathers? He wasn't there in a sense. And the angel tells him, mighty warrior, you know, the Lord is with you, mighty, mighty warrior, whatever. And he's like, so if, if God is with us, then where's the power? Do you understand what I'm getting at? If God is with us, where's the miracles? If God is with us, then where's the Red Sea parting? If God is with us, then why are things like they are? And the angel said to him, go in this recognition of yours. I'm changing the wording, but go in this strength of yours. Which, what strength? The realization that things are not supposed to be like that. That God has promised things to be much greater. That God has promised things to be much on a much higher level. That God has promised His power, His blessing, miracles, signs, wonders, and His favor upon them. So there was a strength, in a sense, in His recognition. Wait a minute. It's not supposed to be like this. This is not it. There's got to be more than this. God, this cannot be all that it, it cannot be that I'm supposed to be always dealing with the same problems, with the same issues, the same weaknesses, the same temptations, the same sins. It cannot be that everybody's supposed to just get weaker and weaker and just slowly backslide and turn away from the Lord or get sick and die or whatever may be the situation. Whatever may be, it, it's not supposed to be like that. You understand the point? There's a, when, there, when there's an understanding of God's will, because our general tendency is to always interpret everything through our own experience. We think it's always been like this, and this is how it's supposed to be. We have no basis for that idea except our experience. We think, oh, it's just normal like this. Oh, yeah, well, you know, we can't. That's because our minds are not renewed by the Word of God. That's because we're interpreting reality through our own experience. It's a deadly error, and everybody does it until the Word of God comes and pricks us, until the Word of God comes and pokes us, until the Word of God comes and stirs us, until the Word of God comes and convicts us. You realize everybody in Jerusalem, there was probably some people there that were not happy that Jesus was crucified, but they didn't really, well, you know, that's just how it goes. They knew he wasn't guilty, but they're like, well, you know, maybe he got too loud, maybe he said a little too much, and you know how those uh, the rulers of the temple are, you know how the Pharisees and the high priests are, they're just, they're just like that, maybe I'm fine, you know. And then Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and preached to them and said, You crucified Jesus, whom God sent to be the Lord and Savior. And they were pricked. And they saw, wait a minute, before I knew he was crucified, but I had a different lens. I had a different interpretation. I thought it was okay. I thought it was normal. It was expected. It wasn't so bad. 
And now the prophetic revelation, the word of the Lord comes and just it just explodes and it just pierces the darkness of the false idea, the false mindset, the lie that was lodged in the mind of the people. And now they have to face reality. What must we do to be saved? What are we going to do? And that's the point of preaching the Bible. It's the truth. And our experience may be way below the truth, way below the Bible, way below the reality. And so we hear the word of God. We hear the will of God. We hear the promises of God. And it's supposed to provoke us. It's supposed to pierce us. It's supposed to prick our hearts and bring us to a conviction. This is not right. I cannot accept this. Some of the greatest breakthroughs of my spiritual life have been when I realized what, in the, what am I allowing the devil to just play games with my head all day long? You know he'll play games with your head all day long as long as you let him all life long. As long as we let the devil, the devil will play with your head. If you let him, he will. And there has to come a conviction. This is the devil. What am I doing? Rise up and overcome. It's not supposed to be like this. Not supposed to live under this sort of a, a bondage or an oppression or a lie or a depression or whatever it may be. No, in the name of Jesus, this is not right. You understand? It's not right. And when people begin to interpret things, they interpret reality through their experience. What they do oftentimes is they say, oh, well, you know, you know, Paul was oppressed. Oh, Paul was a depressed man. Paul, they'll read Romans 7. You see, Paul was struggling with sin a lot. And they're totally distorting the scripture. They're totally misquoting the Bible. They're totally uh, taking it out of context because they want the Bible now to fit their experience where it's supposed to be. The Bible's supposed to convict us and bring us up to the real biblical experience. Do you understand the difference? The Bible is supposed to to propel us forward, not convince us that everything is just okay as it is, because it's not. Because it's not. It's a lie of the devil. It's a trap of the devil to get us to just settle. This is just how it is. It's how it's always been. How it was with our forefathers. That's how it will always be. What a bunch of rubbish. What does the Bible actually say? Do we actually believe the Bible? Or are we just playing games? We're we just playing church. I mean, if we really believe the Bible, then we have to really see what it says and believe it and comply it and be convicted and be uh, be uh, challenged and propelled forward into, you know, going forward with God. Otherwise, we're playing games with God. We're not serious about God. How can you just like live this lukewarm um, type of life and say, "Well, I believe the Bible." Well, no, you don't. Well, I do. I'm a Christian because all Christians believe the Bible. You cannot just say, well, I'm in this position. So that the, the question is, do you really believe the Word of God? It, it comes out when we actually see what it says and do we apply it to our life or not. It's not just like a default position. Well, I was born a Muslim or I was born a Christian or I believe the Bible is all true. You might think you do, but you don't. Because when you, when you, the question is when we read it and we see what, it's, what is written, we see what is promised, we see how it's supposed to be, does it prick us? Does it challenge us? Does it stir us? Does it make us realize, wait a minute, this is not right. We need to go up. We need to go higher. We need to break through. We need to get a hold of God. We need a revival. Does it do that? If not, and you say, well, you know, it's just how it is. And you don't believe the Bible then, or you're not reading it, or you're reading it with your, you know, with your eyes closed. Most people do. That's why they never get anything out of it. They read it with their eyes closed, not their physical eyes. You couldn't see the words if you did that. But with their spiritual eyes closed, they have no expectation. They have no hope. They're not looking to get anything out of the Word of God. Uh, they're just going through the motions. They're just going through the ritual. This is my daily prayer or my daily Bible reading. This is, you know, what we read. And now we're going through Romans. And now we, and it's like, yeah, no wonder you never change. No wonder you never get anything out of it. Never. No wonder there's no breakthrough because you're reading the Bible with your eyes closed. Your heart's eyes closed. No hope, no faith, no love. No expectation, no openness, no hunger, no thirst for righteousness. Well, what do we think the result's going to be? Well, it's going to be the same result every time. It was, um, what's his name? I was going to say Tom Sawyer, but not Tom Sawyer. Mark Twain wrote Tom Sawyer. Uh, Mark Twain said the definition of insanity is to... Keep doing the same thing every time and expect a different result. Keep doing what you're doing and ex every time, I'll do, I'll do it again, and, and expect you're going to get a different result. That's the definition of insanity, according to Mark Twain. 
You understand the point. The Word of God, if we really take it and believe it, it will never leave us as we are. It will convict us. It will challenge us. It will, it will confuse us. It will, uh, it will uh, compel us. It will it'll break us. It will humble us. It will have a myriad of, of, of mighty effects upon us if we read it with our eyes open. If we read it without our colored glasses on. If we read it as it's supposed to be taken, as the Word of God. That's what it is. As the living Word of God. The Word of God for today. It's the Word of God for tonight. It's the Word of God for our lives. It's the Word of God for our church. If God has nothing to say, if God has nothing to say to us tonight, we might as well close our Bibles, turn off our computers, and go home. We have no point to be together other than maybe we can just go and eat a meal together or something. And, but we say, oh yeah, that's true. We believe that. Okay, but here's the question. Do we, do we really expect that we're going to hear from God? Do we come expecting that God's going to speak to me tonight? God's going to, God actually has something to say to me and I'm going to hear it. It makes a big difference. We'll be judged according to how we hear. To him who has much, um, who, to him who is given much, much is required. And to the one who is given, you're, you're given, it's, it's entrusted to you, but you don't make anything of it. You just let it fall by the wayside. You just you ignore it or whatever. What's been given will be taken away. I, I spoke on Sunday about God, the most horrible curse that could come on a man, the most horrible curse that could come upon a church is that God withdraw his spirit from them. And God does do this. God does it. God does do this. Otherwise, the Bible wouldn't speak about it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the picture of the Spirit of God, the glory of God, leaving the temple in Jerusalem because of their idolatry and unrepentance. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the picture of, of, of Judas, you know, um, hanging himself and committing suicide and falling in a field and his gut spilling out. God left him. God left him. Otherwise, we wouldn't have such warnings as we have in the book of Hebrews. It talks about those that were once enlightened, those that once tasted of the powers of the age to come, those that were once partakers of the Holy Spirit and the, the grace of God. If they turn away, there's no more repentance available for them. Nothing left for them but the horrible judgment of God. And it says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's written to Christians, it's written to believers. So we have to take that, we have to take heed to these warnings. If we don't take heed to these warnings, I think it comes down to we don't believe the Bible. And I think that I'm convinced that most Christians don't actually believe the Bible. Although they'll swear by the Bible, although they'll defend the Bible, although they'll say, well, I believe the Bible, they, they really don't believe it. They don't believe it. They don't believe it. Because when it comes down to the specifics, they don't actually think it's true or it won't really, God won't really do that. God won't really do all the things that he said. Yes, God will. Or this whole thing is a lie. So when we come to the Bible, we have to come to it with fear and trembling, recognizing this is real and it will happen as it is spoken here. People get very emboldened in their sin because they sin once and nothing happens. They sin twice, nothing happens, and then they go on and they God's not going to do anything to me. It's not true. But what they don't realize is that God's judgment for them was that God did not do anything. That was his judgment. He let them go. He let them go. That's the judgment of God. See, God disciplines those that he loves. Those that are his children, those that he cares about, he will discipline them. But if God doesn't discipline and just lets you go in your sin, that's God's judgment. That means that we've hardened our heart against him and now he's hardened against us, turning away from us. It's not a blessing when nothing happens when you sin. You didn't get away with it. Exactly what God promised has happened. What? Judgment. People always think of judgment as lightning coming down and striking or some big trauma coming into our lives. That's not true. 
That's totally not true. I mean, that happens. That's a form of judgment. But the most terror, probably the most terrifying or the most terrible judgment in the Bible is the silence of God, where God just goes silent and does not speak. How many years is it from Malachi to the gospel? 500 years. Nothing. No prophets, no word from God, no revelation. Silence. No scripture written, no revival, nothing. 500 years of silence. God can go silent. And we must not mistake his silence for his tolerance. God have mercy. This is why we need to fear the Lord. Because these things are real. And if we don't recognize that God is absolutely committed to his word and to fulfill everything, every word he's ever spoken, every promise, every threat, everything will be fulfilled. If we don't take that at face value, if we don't really cling to that and tremble at his word, then those words will come upon us as a curse. Because we'll sin and we think, well, nothing happened, didn't bother anything, God didn't. And, and exactly what God promised has been fulfilled. Judgment has come, the silence of God, the inaction of God. What a horrible judgment to be left in our sin, to not be dealt with, to not be disciplined, to not be brought back to God, but to go further and further and further away from God. So this is why the, the Lord says it, um, blessed are those who tremble at his word, tremble at his word, recognizing that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? The human heart is the most deceitful thing in the universe. It's so deceitful, you can deceive yourself and not even know it. It not only will deceive other people, you can deceive yourself. Self-deception, probably the greatest curse of our generation. So many people are self-deceived, completely self-deluded, completely blinded to self. So, this is the reality. The promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And the threats and the curses and the judgments of God are also yes and amen. They're also true. And they will be fulfilled. They will come to pass in the lives of those that deserve them. And the ones that deserve them are those that do not take heed at God's word. They don't tremble at God's word. They don't obey God's word. They do what's right in their own eyes. They're led according to their flesh, not according to the spirit. And God only has one thing to say to them. Depart from me, I never knew you. That's it. There's no second chance. When it comes down to judgment for disobedience and rebellion and hardness of heart, God has nothing else to say to you but depart from me, I never knew you. Think about that. Think about yourself. That, that, I think about it for myself. I think that could actually be spoken to me if I do not tremble at God's word and follow God and walk with God. Think about it. You have to think about it personally. You have to personally apply it. Don't think of it just in like a, a general sense for everybody out there. But think about that. And Is that what you want to hear on the day of judgment? Depart from me. I never knew you. Well, one of the ways we can avoid that is by recognizing the possibility of that coming to pass. And then taking heed according to his word trembling at his word and doing whatever we have to do to avoid God's faithful threatenings. I, want, I would like to say the word promise, but we don't usually use the word promise in that sense, but it is a promise. In other words, God said, the soul that sins shall die. So it's a promise. In other words, it will absolutely happen. In that sense, it's a promise. But it's not a positive thing, so we usually don't use the word promise. So we use the word threat. It's a threat. It's a curse. They're as secure as his promises. They're as absolute as his promises. And so... We have to take 
God at his word. And I think that sometimes our problem is uh, a little bit deeper than we realize. It's not just, oh, well, for some reason I'm not really that hungry for the things of God. That may be, sometimes we can get like that, we can get spiritually dull. Like if you had a few days you didn't really pray that much or you haven't had time to really seek God, spiritually you can get kind of dull. But I'm not talking about that. That's one thing. You can usually recover from that very quickly. Just spend some time with the Lord. Just get on your face before God. Hear a, a good sermon. Let something prick your heart. Let something stir you up. Usually it doesn't take that long to recover from something like that. But I'm talking about a scene or a scenario where it's become a pattern of life. In other words, the anointing on your life has been lost. That edge that you had, that conviction that you had, that fire that you had, is it's, it's not just like temporarily kind of, it's not just temporarily kind of withdrawn, but it's like gone. That's a nightmare scenario. Listen to me, that is a spiritual nightmare scenario. If somebody lives in sin, is practicing sin, the Bible doesn't give them any hope of eternal life, even if they've been baptized, even if they've been born again, even if they speak in tongues. I don't care. It doesn't matter. If somebody is not living right, the Bible gives them no promise of eternal life. but only the horrible threat of eternal judgment. We have to believe these things, and it will help us to overcome backsliding. It's very simple. It's not so hard, actually. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah? The, be the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a foundation of everything. What is the fear of the Lord? Well, believing that God is and that everything he says is true, both his promises and his, and his threatenings, both his blessings and his cursings, both the salvation of the cross as well as the horrible lake of fire promised for all those that live in sin. Notice I didn't say for those that are not Christians. I'm not distinguishing between Christians and not, I don't care. It's If you live in sin, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, if you live in sin, you will be in the lake of fire. Don't test me on this. You Don't gamble your soul on this. It's not worth it. You understand what I'm saying? Don't, don't gamble on this one. Don't say, well, I'll, we'll see at the end. No, no, it's too late. If you'd say, well, I just want to live in sin, we'll find out if it, no, it's too late then. Don't gamble, it's not worth it. The Bible's very clear that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so, we have to take God at his word. Believe him. And it will help us. Because we're going to go through a lot of trials and tribulations in this life. Whether you've just begun your journey or you've been on it for a while, Paul, Paul said to the believers in the book of Acts, he said, we must go through many trials, many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. We would love to get around that. You can't. And many opportunities and, and excuses to backslide. Have you ever had a good excuse to backslide? I think I've had more than all of you. I could come up with so many reasons to hate people, to, um, to be filled with bitterness, or to... I could come up with so many excuses to backslide. There's always a million reasons to backslide. But every single one of them will take you to the same place. 
It doesn't matter how good of a, you know, we don't live the Christian life just by our intellect or by our mind or by our own understanding. Sometimes we don't understand things, but we still must be faithful. We still must persevere. You understand? It's, you don't have to understand everything, but you have to fear God. But it doesn't make sense. Why did it, it shouldn't be like this? It's not fair. and all. That. Yeah, I know. I've had my own share of those sorts of situations as well. I don't understand everything. And I probably never will in this life. But one thing I know is this. That God is real. Jesus is the Son of God. And there is a day of judgment. And there is a lake of fire. And all the unbelieving, 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 Liars, the unbelieving, idolaters, fornicators, greedy, they will be cast into a lake of fire. Whether they've been baptized or not, whether they've served in church or not, whether they've experienced miracles or not. Remember all the people that actually did miracles that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 7? They actually did miracles. And then he says to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Lord, did we not preach in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? Yes, he doesn't deny that. He doesn't deny they did miracles in his name. But they were rejected. Why? Because they did not do the will of the Father. That's why. Not because of the miracles. Not be Because they did not do the will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? What was the will of the... Well, his teaching in, in the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7 in, in Matthew, that's, what he's, that's the context. If somebody sinned against you, forgive them, love one another, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, uh, pray for those that spitefully use you and bless those that curse you. And, and, and um, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. People think, well, I, but I have to have my right eye because I cannot do business, for example, without my right eye. Fine, keep your right eye, do your business, and recognize that you will go to hell and you'll have no excuse because God said, listen, that's the purpose of that illustration. Christianity is not for babies. It's not for wimps. It's not for people that love the world. It's not for people that are living to get all the... The, the pleasures of this life. Christianity is not for you. If that's, if that's what you think, if that's what you want, then Christianity is not for you. It's only a matter of time before you backslide. Think of the rich young ruler. Jesus just dealt with him on day one. <laughs> just dealt with him on day one. Lord, what must I do to get eternal life? Sell everything you have and come and follow me. He's like, I'm not doing that. Okay, goodbye. And he left. And now he's in hell. Christianity is not for people that want to please everyone around them. If you want to please everyone around them, Paul said, if I were to living to please men, that I could not be a servant of Christ. You cannot be a servant of Christ if you want to please people. You can't do it. You know how many, how many sins are committed in the name of pleasing people or not offending people? Sins against God. Because we fear man more than we fear God. If we're going to serve God, we have to be willing to offend people. Because we will. We have to be... I don't mean go and be mean to people, be a jerk to people. That's sin. I mean by our lifestyle and our choices that go against the current of this world, they will be offended, they will be hurt, and they will sometimes hate us. If you're not willing to be hated for the name of Christ, you know what? Listen to this. You're not worthy to be his disciple. That's what he said. If you're not willing to suffer persecution from your family or your friends or the society around you, you're not worthy to be his disciple. Not worthy. You can't be his disciple. He doesn't allow it. You have to put him first. Not your family, not your friends, not your job, not your career. Nothing. It must be Jesus. And you will be tested on this. More than once. And... I mean, there's this other aspect, too. If we are ashamed of him before men, he'll be ashamed of us before his Father in heaven. So if you're ashamed of the gospel, you're ashamed of Jesus before friends at school or at work or at home, or whatever it may be, wherever it may be, you're ashamed of Jesus. You're, you're afraid to be recognized as a 
Christian, a real Christian. You're afraid for people to know your, you know, your standards or whatever. Then you're ashamed of Jesus. He said, I'll be ashamed of you. You deny me before men, but then you expect me to accept you into my heavenly kingdom. He says, it won't happen like that. You'll be denied from entrance into my kingdom. Does this not cause you to fear? Does this not cause you to tremble? It should. If it doesn't, then I think you're not hearing properly what I'm saying. Because every single one of us are subject to these temptations to some degree or another. To be ashamed of Jesus, it's very easy to be ashamed of the name of Christ. But it can disguise itself. It can come in different ways. But if we, if we look at what's motivating us or what it, the, when it comes down to it, it's, we should not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus. We should not be ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said, because it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. And it's so easy to fall into the trap of trying to please people, especially family, especially if you're Chinese. I'm sorry to say, because the culture, the Chinese culture, the family relationships is so close and tight and important to disobey that is like the ultimate sin. Ultimate sin. Ultimate sin. Is to go against the family. It's kind of like, sorry, it's kind of almost like the mafia rules. There's nothing worse than going, you're a, a needs. You are a, a despicable rascal of a son. A useless, worthless son. If you go against what your parents desire or what they suggest or what they insist or what they command or whatever if you if you don't live your life or do things the way they want or you go you make choices against them blah 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 whatever it is or you make you'll be hated jesus said you'll be hated by all the nations that's what he said it's a promise that we are to be hated we don't want to be hated. I don't want to be hated. You don't want to be hated. What do we want more? People to like us or God to be pleased with us. I mean, it's a very simple decision. 